It's good to hear some good conversation. And I hear that the uh, conversation gets better over Canaps. So make sure you stick around, continue the conversation then. But uh, kia ora te whanau. my name's Cameron, I'm the lead pastor here at Village Baptist and it's really good having you all with us, joining us as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday. Uh, if you're new to uh, Village Baptist, uh, we love Easter here. In fact, uh, for us, Easter is a busier time of year, even than Christmas. On Thursday, we saw uh, 48 of our intermediates and youth head off to E Camp or Easter Camp along with their leaders, and that in addition to. And this afternoon, as you've already heard, we're hosting a Easter event. It's going to be held just out here in the church backyard. It's called Easter Extra, low-key event that anyone can attend. There'll be good food, good activities, an Easter egg trail, and it's free for anyone to come and join us as we celebrate Easter. So do come along if you've got a free afternoon and join us because it will be a lot of fun. But when it comes to Easter and all that we are able to say about it, when we think about it, we very quickly realize and, and discover that everything that we can say about Easter is grounded in the relationship that we explored last week. And that's the depths of Christ's embrace of us. Because what we see in the life of Jesus is that we have been fully embraced by him. Through being born as a child, we saw how he has embraced even the messiness of human growth and development. Through participating in a baptism of repentance, we, we saw how he embraced us even in the messiness of the sin that affects us from within. And through calling disciples who he knew would sin against him. And through subjecting himself to a wrongful execution, Jesus has embraced even the messiness of the sin that affects us from the outside through experiencing the pain within himself of being sinned against and that internal wrestle that results from having to work through a forgiveness process on the other side. When we talk about Jesus, you know, though he may be perfectly holy and perfectly clean, the gospel claim is that the Son of God fully embraced the messiness that we experience with no exceptions. And he did this through taking humanity to himself, being born as Jesus, and living as one of us. In some of um, the writings of the late Tim Keller, um, he identifies a particular set of desires that sit within each of us um, that can find themselves in competition. And the first desire he identifies is a desire to be fully known. We want people to know who we truly are. And the other desire is that we would be fully loved. And though we want both, though we want to be fully known and to be fully loved, fear often gets in the way. The fear that to be fully known wouldn't result in being fully loved, but rather to be fully known would, be, would mean that we would be, or might be, fully rejected. And that fear of rejection, if we were to be fully known, it can lead us to settle for the superficial comfort of being loved but not known. But what we have in Jesus is that because he has fully embraced us, we're able to experience what it means to be both, to be both fully known and to be fully loved in him because Christ knew our mess. He knew our messiness and he embraced us in it anyway. This is what we explored last week. And, and this alone is just hugely significant because what it means is that through Jesus' embrace of us, he is able to meet one of our deepest needs, to be fully known and fully loved. But as good as this is, the depths of Christ's embrace goes even further 
again. And to describe how this works, I'm going to draw on an illustration that they use in the Alpha course, which, by the way, is a really good course to participate in if you're wanting to know more about Christianity, you're wanting to get back into the basics. Um, Alpha course is a really uh, good place for you. And we have another course actually starting in four weeks, I believe. So we've got another course coming up real quick. But in the Alpha Course, Nikki Gumbel uses an illustration of a Bible and a piece of paper. Pretty simple stuff. And what he does is he places the piece of paper in the Bible and then asks the question, what does being in the Bible mean for the paper? What does it mean? Well, what it means is that what happens to the Bible now happens to the paper as well. You know, if I took this Bible, put it on the ground and stood on it, I would not only be standing on the Bible, but I'd also be standing on the paper that's inside it. If I took this Bible and I threw it across the room, the paper would go with it and land in the same place As the Bible, if I took this Bible and I ran into the cafe kitchen, tossed it in the dishwasher and ran it through a cycle, the paper would get drenched alongside the Bible because the paper is inside the Bible. What happens to the Bible happens to the paper. And the reason why Nikki Gumbel uses this illustration on the Alpha Course is because the Bible talks about a similar relationship that exists between us and Jesus. That because we have been fully embraced by him, we are now, as the Bible calls, it describes it as being in him, such that what happens to him happens to us as well. And this is super important when it comes to understanding what Jesus was up to on that first Easter weekend. What he was actually doing for us when he was on the cross on Good Friday and what he was doing for us in his resurrection on Easter Sunday. And one of the places where in the Bible where this is explained is in one of, uh, is in found in two of Paul's letters to a church in Corinth. And in the second letter that he wrote to that church, Paul says this about Jesus and what he was doing for us on the cross. There he says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Here Paul's saying that through Christ's embrace of us, he has taken to himself the full messiness of our sin. And having taken it to himself, he bore the consequence of that sin in himself that we could be fully and totally forgiven. Now, it doesn't mean that we now live consequence-free lives. Actions still have consequences. But what it means is that our failings are no longer final. What it means is that sin no longer gets the final word because our sin is no longer a barrier between us and And Jesus, because he paid the price for our sins even before we were born. That we can live the fullness of our lives in the fullness of his forgiveness. But Jesus' work on the cross doesn't simply mean that we are forgiven. That's great, that happens, but that's not all of the story. It doesn't mean that he's just taken our account out of deficit. But since we've been fully embraced by Jesus, he hasn't just taken our sins to himself and purchased and paid the price for it. But having been embraced by Jesus, we have also become fully dignified through becoming the righteousness of God. And now I understand for many of us, that sort of language will be really unfamiliar. That's not the sort of language we use every day, but it means two things. Firstly, what it means to become the righteousness of God means that God has gone beyond paying the debt of our sin to credit even more to our account again. It means that he's gone beyond simply releasing us from a kind of slavery to sin to raise us up that we might be seated next to him and given the honor and the dignity of being made into a child or a son, a daughter 
or a son of him. Through Christ's embrace of you, and that his death on the cross, that is who you are now. You are a son or a daughter of God. You have become the righteousness of God. And you might say, Cam, that how could that possibly be true? How could something like that possibly be true when my life looks nothing like that? Not only does my life not look like it, I don't really feel like that either. I don't feel, feel particularly righteous. I don't feel like I look have much family resemblance with God to be his child. So how can that be true? Well, let me ask you a question. How could an Australian woman born in Tasmania with no understanding of royal protocol or the Danish language become a member of the Danish royal family? Some of you might have come across this story on the news recently because this happened with this woman here, the Tasmanian-born Mary Donaldson, who's been in the news recently because she's actually now ascended to become the Queen of Denmark. How this happened, how this person became a Danish royal when their life looked nothing like Danish royalty was because she got into a relationship with a Danish prince. And the status of that prince translated over to her. And over time, she learnt how to live into that newfound status. But not only was she given a status that she learnt to live into, that status gave her access to the tools she needed to live into it. It gave her access to classes on royal protocol. It gave her access to classes on the Danish language such that she is now fluent in both and now more popular with the Danes than her Danish husband. And the same thing is true about the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God being a child of his, that's a status that you have been given. And it's one that you'll spend a lifetime learning to live into. But it's also a status that gives you access. It gives you access to the resources you need to grow into it. Because through becoming a child of God, you've been given the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God who lives within you and fosters his ongoing transformation of you. Through his embrace, what happened to Jesus happened to us, such that through his embrace, he has earned for us the forgiveness of our sin. He has dignified us with the status of being a child of God. And he has resourced us, gifted us with the Holy Spirit that we might have what we need to live into that status of his child. But of course, Easter doesn't conclude with Good Friday because we're here on Sunday celebrating, and not only remembering the death of Jesus, but celebrating his resurrection. And here too we find that Christ's embrace of us makes all the difference as it means that all that he has earned for us and all the good that he has applied to us has been stabilized and secured for all eternity. A few years ago, my wife and I were given an avocado tree. And I don't know if you're very familiar with avocado trees. They're a little bit unique, a little bit peculiar, in that an avocado tree typically has, they have male and female varieties. And so typically you need one of each for the trees to bear fruit. You need a male avocado and a female avocado. However, there is a variety in New Zealand that is semi-self-fertile, meaning that while they would still benefit from having another complementary tree, they're still able to produce fruit themselves. 
And we got given one of the, we got given an avocado tree a few years ago, and we found ourselves in that period between the planting of the tree and the first harvest. And that's a bit of an anxious time because you don't know if you've if you if you've got the right variety. You, you purchased the one, you did your research to try and make sure you got the one that's semi self fertile, the one that will be able to bear a crop, but then you plant it and you take the tag off, and a few months later, you go, Oh, did I get the right one? Because if I didn't get the right one, it's just going to be another tree. And I'm a millennial. I need my avocados. <laughs> and so there is an anxious wait between the planting of the tree and the removal of the tag and the harvest to come. Well, I'm pleased to announce that this year, after anxiously waiting, <laughs> our tree formed the first fruits of its life. Now, the tree is still quite small, too small to sustain many, if any, of these avocados. But what these little fruits are, they are a promise. They are a promise of a greater harvest to come. We got the right tree. This is how Paul describes the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday. That because he has fully embraced us, his resurrection doesn't begin and end with him, but it extends to us as well, as his resurrection is for us the first fruits. It is the promise of an even greater resurrection to come. And Paul says this in another letter that he also wrote to the church in Corinth, though this one was sent a little earlier than the last one. In this letter he said, but Christ indeed has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn. Christ the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. And what this means is that Jesus has secured for us our own resurrection, for he has fully embraced us such that what happens to him happens to us. His payment covers our sins. His status is extended to us, and his victory over death is our victory in him. Which is why Jesus, in knowing the victory that was to come, was able to say, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And why? Why can believers have faith that, the, even, that they will live even though they die? How can they have faith in a resurrection to come? Because they have been fully embraced by Christ. And so his resurrection is for us the first fruits. It is the promise of our own resurrection that will take place on the other side of death. Now, for those who have been around a little while, you'll, you'll know that uh, I, I, when, I, when I was growing up, I went to a Christian school, uh, which means that sometimes we have unique experiences of the conversations that we had in the schoolyard. And for us, one of those unique conversations that we had was about trying to speculate what our resurrected lives would look like. Trying to get our head around it. I mean, that's a typical high school conversation, yeah? That's how it works. When we were having those conversations, there's one time that I made the proposal that since God is holy and because he hates sin, then those parts of us that are yet to be perfected, those parts that are still affected by sin, well, well maybe those parts won't participate in a resurrection to come. Meaning that if we died with unresolved sin, then maybe we could end up eternally disfigured as we wouldn't be fully resurrected, but only partly resurrected, as it's just the good stuff that goes through to the other side and everything else gets left behind. Couldn't quite work out if it was limbs that would be left behind or just like holes like Swiss cheese. Um, I did try to get an AI-generated image, but the search thing of man with holes through his body gets flagged. So <laughs> be careful what you, what you search for. 
Um, But if Christ's embrace of us wasn't total, if Christ's embrace of us didn't extend to include all the messiness that we experience in this life, then yeah, that schoolyard idea of mine, that might have merit. Because if it were true, if we weren't totally embraced, then we don't have reason to believe that we will fully participate in a resurrection to come. We couldn't have full confidence that we have been fully forgiven if we haven't been fully embraced. We couldn't have confidence in our full dignification that comes from being made a child of God if we haven't been fully embraced by Christ. If Christ's embrace of us was only partial, then everything that flows from it is partial too. But the thing is, Christ's embrace wasn't partial, was it? Christ was born as a child that he might embrace the messiness of human growth and development. He participated in a baptism of repentance that he might embrace the messiness of the sin we wrestle with within. And he called disciples who he knew would sin against him and subjected himself to a wrongful execution to embrace the messiness that comes from being sinned against. Christ has embraced us in our fullness that we might fully live in the freedom of being fully known and fully loved, fully forgiven and fully dignified in the full hope of a full resurrection, not a partial one that will follow after his. Having been fully embraced What this means is that you have been fully forgiven, fully dignified, and you have already had your resurrection fully secured. All of this has been done for you because even while you were still a sinner, even while you were in the depths of your messiness, Christ fully embraced you and he died and he rose for you. Which means that for us, for you, for me, the question for us becomes, will will we rest in Christ's love? Will we rest in the forgiveness he offers? Will we rest in the dignity he gives? Will we rest in the resurrection that's been secured for us? Will we rest in the fullness of Christ's embrace of us? And if you haven't found your rest in Jesus through placing your trust in him, or maybe, maybe your trust has shifted and your rest has become disrupted, I want to invite you to give your trust back to Jesus again this morning. And the thing is, when it comes to placing our trust in Jesus, when it comes to resting in his embrace of us, it doesn't require much. In fact, arguably, all it requires is that we stop resisting his love as his love pursues us wherever we are, wherever we find ourselves, and even whatever feelings we have to him, he pursues us even in our rejection of him. One of the ways in which we can do something to embody that decision to cease resisting, to rest in his embrace, is by just offering a simple prayer of trust. And that's what I want to lead us through this morning. So you don't even have to do that alone. I'll walk you through it. And you can just repeat those words after me in your mind and in your heart. So let me encourage you, if you haven't given your trust to Jesus, or maybe you have, but that trust has begun to shift. Let me invite you as we take a moment to pray now to take the words that, I'm say, that I'll pray and to personalize them as a prayer that you offer to Jesus in your heart. Let's pray. And if that's you, why don't you join with me? Jesus, I thank you that even in my mess, you have fully embraced me. 
Thank you for the life you have opened for me, a life in which I can be fully known and fully loved, a life I can live in the fullness of your forgiveness, the dignity you offer, and the assurance of a resurrection to come. So I choose to trust you and to live into the life you have opened for me. Fill me with your spirit that I might be transformed into the person you have made me to be, the righteousness of God and a child of yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, I pray for all of us, not only for those who have committed to trusting in you, either for the first time or afresh, I pray for all of us that we might all experience the closeness of your presence and the reassurance of your embrace, that we might be drawn deeper into the life you have for us, a life that is marked by love, forgiveness, dignity, and eternal assurance. I pray this in Jesus' name.